Hello. Today's video will be of immeasurable use to anybody who's got to analyse Shakespeare's use of language and structure, the writer's craft, if you will, in an extract of Macbeth. And just like the exam, I'm going to lay on an extract from the play and then an exam question for us to grapple with. Not only that, but I'll be exploring and explaining how I'll answer the question and throwing in some beautifully shaped model paragraphs to firm up your idea of what makes a top spec exam response. Oh, and I make no apologies. There's going to be an awful lot of ropey cartoons in here. In fact, the best thing you could say about these cartoons is that they're better than the jokes that accompany them. So, you know, if cringeworthy delivery ain't your thing, hey, these are not the revision videos you are looking for. I guarantee, though, stick with it. It is going to have an astonishingly positive effect on your exam performance. This plain English explanation of the examiner's criteria, the mark scheme, is linked to the edXL exam board, but I guarantee it will accord very closely with whatever exam board you are studying with. So you're analysing or evaluating the writer's craft, that use of language and structural techniques, and you're also going to be going on to suggest what effect or impact these techniques have on the reader. Unfortunately, if you're doing the edXL exam, you have to look at both language and structural techniques, otherwise your response is much used as sugar toothpaste or waterproof tea bags. It's imperative you look at both to enable you to access the highest marks. There's a top tip at the bottom there. Make sure that you're focusing on the question. This is not just an attempt to find as many similes and metaphors and examples of punctuation in the extract. Your response has to be linked, it has to be wedded to the question that's set. And of course, I'm going to go on to show you how to do that. And please do employ appropriate terminology. If you find a metaphor, mention it's a metaphor. You find an imperative sentence or an order, please name check it. You do get credit for that. So you open up your exam paper and this is exactly the kind of critter that could leap out at you. It's framed and phrased exactly like the Edexcel Part A questions. Let's have a read. Explore how Shakespeare presents the relationship between Banquo and Macbeth in this extract. Now for the sake of convenience, I've already been busy with my paintball gun and I've highlighted the key words here. How, as in what are the language and structural techniques Shakespeare uses. So that's how Shakespeare's presenting, and of course this key idea, the relationship between Banquo and Macbeth. Now I freely admit that those relationship style questions are really awkward ones to sink your teeth into. I mean, if the examiner's feeling generous, you know, his piles aren't playing up too badly, you might get a joyfully straightforward question like uh, explore how Shakespeare presents character in this extract. Let's assume, worst case scenario, we get a sticky, fiddly question asking us to look at relationships. How do we respond to that? What can we look at? Well, my jazzy little mind map here offers a few ways that we could respond to this question. I dare say there's more. We could think about what they say to each other. What's that really revealing about each character's thoughts and feelings towards the other? We could also look at how they speak to each other. We look later at the term, the royal we, that kind of tone or mode of address can be significant. We can think about what they do to each other. Actions reveal relationships, don't they? And of course we can think about what they say about each other. Not necessarily to each other, but about each other. That sheds light on the relationship too. Here is the extract that we're going to be looking at in response to that question. It's the start of Act 3, Scene 1. Macbeth is now king and Banquo harbours some suspicions about how he came to be king. He suspects regicide. He suspects Macbeth of killing King Duncan. Here's the rest of that extract, verbal exchange between Banquo and Macbeth. You usually get about 20 or 30 lines in these exam extracts. And if you're with Edexcel, you've got about half an hour to read this extract, understand it, annotate it for language and structural techniques, based, of course, on the question that's set, and to write a response. 10 minutes to plan, 20 minutes to write. That'd be your rough breakdown of the job. We'll delve into the text then, see what we can winkle out that sheds light on the relationship between Macbeth and Banquo. First thing we're going to lock our literary laser vision onto is this line of Macbeth's towards the end of the extract, Fail not our feast. That's what he says to Banquo. So what has been revealed here about Banquo and Macbeth's relationship? Well, this use of imperative, this order, Fail not our feast, it shows that Macbeth is now in a position of power over Banquo because he can dish out demands, he can cough out commands and his subject now his faithful servant Banquo has to obey now students who are familiar with my videos know the trick I'm trying here I'm dipping 
back into the evidence, fell not our feast. Having a route around and trying to find something else that I can analyse or extrapolate in the bid to accrue the highest marks. And I found something, fell not our feast. You or I would say, fell not my feast. What Matt Beth's doing here is using the royal we. It's a term of address favoured by monarchs and rulers, uh, using that collective pronoun we, so not fail my feast, fail our feast. And what this is doing is just emphasising or reinforcing Macbeth's new elevated status over his friend. Once we've dredged up these intelligent ideas, our next step is to spin them into award-winning paragraphs that are going to have the examiner's eyes popping out in disbelief at our wisdom and generic greatness. A bit like the paragraph I've lovingly crafted here. We'll have a read and then we'll think about why it is so good. Macbeth's use of imperative in the scene reveals an aspect of the relationship. He says to Banquo, fell not our feast. This successfully came, conveys to the reader the hierarchy that now underpins the relationship because we see the king give orders and the subject to obey. Furthermore, the use of the royal we in our feast reinforces this idea of Macbeth's power and status over his old friend. So I've got busy with the paintball gun and you can see now highlighted the features of this paragraph that are making it such a winner as far as the examiner is concerned. Let's have a look. So first of all, I've cited the technique that's used, an imperative and order, that's a structural technique. I've mentioned that I get a hug and a cookie from the examiner for doing so. Uh, relationship, of course, the question was asking us uh, how does Shakespeare explore the relationship between Banco and Macbeth in this scene. So that's acknowledging the question, again, hugging a cookie from the examiner. I've embedded my evidence. I've not just put fail not our feast. I've said, he says to Banquo, fail not our feast. I've woven the quotation into my own sentence. It just sounds a little bit more fluent, a little bit more professional. Successfully, this is an evaluative adverb. Makes it sound like I'm casting judgment on the text. The examiner likes that for some reason. He's also pretty particular about you mentioning the reader the effect on the reader, so please explicitly mention the reader. Hierarchy, that's a high level term for you know, a disparity or a, a status difference in the relationship. Uh, and of course, I like the word because, because that launches into my explanation. This shows the reader that there's a hierarchy there because we see Macbeth giving orders, which the subject will have to obey. Furthermore, that's a little signpost that you're going deeper into analysis, and then I've trowled on that secondary interpretation looking at the royal we. And again, linking it to relationships, saying it reinforces or backs up this idea of Macbeth having power. The second detail from this extract that I'm going to lock in on, in terms of exposing or revealing or presenting the relationship between the two men, is this line from Banquo's, I fear thou place most foully for it. In other words, he suspects Macbeth of the regicide. The technique that I'm going to explore here is that of alliteration, the fear, foully, thought. And uh, what I'm going to say is that the effect of that F is to create a kind of harsh tone. Uh, at GCSE, sounds like F and P and K and T and B. You can call them spitting words, but I think you can collectively refer to them at GCSE as plosives. So maybe in my response I'll use that word plosives. Just a harsh sound and what that's doing is it's capturing Banquo's anger, his frustration towards Macbeth's treachery. So I've taken those ideas on plosives and packaged it up into a truly scrumptious paragraph. I'm going to read it through this time. I'm not going to bother explaining the highlighting. I think, you know, you're smart enough to be going on what I've said before and thinking to yourself, why has Mr Taylor highlighted certain words and phrases here? What best practice for the exam is he drawing my attention to? So go on and read it already, Mr Taylor. Fair enough. Shakespeare's use of alliteration serves to depict Banquo and Macbeth's relationship. Banquo believes Macbeth is king because he played most foully for it. This engagingly emphasises to the reader Banquo's feelings of anger and frustration towards his friend because the plosive F creates a harsh, aggressive tone. Moreover, the adverb foully highlights the immoral nature of Macbeth's success. The relationship then is marked by hostility on Banquo's side. Just a very brief aside about that last line there, uh, the relationship then is marked by hostility on Banquo's side. Uh, I tonked that in because my secondary analysis of the adverb foully, I wasn't sure if it wasn't slightly veering away from the question that was set about the relationship. So I've ensured with that last line that I'm looping back to the question, keeping the content of my paragraphs task focused. The last detail in this extract, I'm going to 
tinker about with and parlay into a paragraph is this metaphor, this language technique, where Banquo presents his loyalty towards Macbeth. He talks about how he's with a most indissoluble tie forever knit. I'd like to make a few knitting jokes here, but I'd probably lose my thread. Hey! If you didn't like that last joke, I'd avert your eyes from the picture on the right here. It's going to hurt. So we've got this metaphor of Banquo's um, telegraphing his loyalty with an indissoluble tie forever knit. Why does this convey a sense of the strength and closeness of the bond? Because knitting suggests something stitched tightly together, an adhesive close bond. We see then that despite Banquo's suspicions about Macbeth, Banquo still respects the social hierarchy. You know, he abides by that chain of command. The king's higher up in the pecking order, therefore it is beholden on Banquo to serve him faithfully and loyally. I'll spare your eardrums, I won't even bother reading this one out. You can read it at your leisure and think about why the highlighter has been applied. I'll be honest here folks, I suspect thus far into the exam response, the examiner's going to have calluses on his hands from applauding so vigorously, such is the quality of the sublime paragraphs I'm throwing at him. However, if I had the time, and that's a big ask when you think that there's 10 minutes to plan and annotate, 20 minutes to respond to the question in the exam, if I had the time, I might think about doing something with this, here's our chief guest, focusing on that adjective chief. Maybe that could convey something about the relationship too. And what does that adjective chief guest suggest about the relationship? Well, it does imply that there's a love and respect that Macbeth appears to have for Banquo. But, you know, focus on the word appears there because, of course, next scene he is plotting Banquo's death. So I'm guessing that that love and reverence has a shelf life on it. And we're out of here. Extract analysed, language and structural techniques identified, exam answered with a grace charming in a land worthy of a prima ballerina. We'll bow out with my daughter's pictures. We say goodbye in England, as they say in China, and apologies to my palmist Wang if I mangle the Mandarin, but Zaicha!